Hello, my name is Sandra Reimer, and I'm the founder of Colabor Nation. And Colabor Nation is a community of marketing and communication freelancers who collaborate to multiply our impact and our income. And today we have a special guest with us, Andrea Johnston. And our facilitator, Andrea, she is, I'm gonna to have to look at this human behavior specialist. And she's the owner of Human Dynamics Training. Through Andrea's engaging teaching, she stretches people to think in new ways. Audiences enjoy her lighthearted approach to serious issues within the workplace, which allows them the opportunity for meaningful personal and professional growth. And I was chatting with Andrea before we got started, and she said she has been with this company, Human Dynamics Training, the owner since 2015 but it has been in her family longer than that. So it's a long standing company with uh, proven models of helping people discover their communication and personality styles. So I am going to uh, turn things over to Andrea. I'm gonna pin you as our presenter. There we go. Wonderful. Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, excited to be here and really excited to be talking about DISC and communication. Um, it's been a while since you guys are getting sort of a, a bit of a hybrid of our keynote and our workshop today. And it's been a while since uh, we've been able to do any keynoting anywhere. <laughs> so I'm excited to be here. Um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen to make sure that I stay on track. And you can give me a thumbs up when and if you can see that. Yes, thank you so much. Wonderful. So yeah, so we'll dive right in because it's a pretty um, power packed uh, time that we have together today. So in human dynamics training, uh, we do like to start off with the land acknowledgement. And these get a little different in our times of virtual uh, training sessions. So um, this isn't showing any favoritism to Sandra or others, but I am also coming to you guys from Kitchener. And so the land acknowledgement I'm going to read is from Kitchener. And uh, of course, uh, as you would like, I invite you to think about the land that you're coming to us from today. So as settler, I respectfully acknowledge that Kitchener is located in the Haldeman Tract on the tr traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Attawandran people. We are grateful for the contributions of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people as the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity. And we recognize their role as they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. So what we're going to get into today, uh, although it's a short time, we want to touch on a couple key areas. So I want to talk to you first about increasing your own awareness in terms of your natural communication style. It might be stuff that's already familiar, but often we do things so naturally, it's just kind of who we are. We may or may not be aware of how we come across or how we you know, naturally communicate. The next thing we want to talk about um, is understanding a little bit about how others communicate and developing a little bit of empathy and awareness around that. The likelihood that everybody you know, live with and work with also uh, communicates in the style that's naturally your own, highly unlikely, right? So we want to sort of branch that out a little bit and start to get a better, better sense of how other people also communicate. And then finally, we want to wrap up with some really practical tips in terms of how you're going to start to be mindful in adjusting your communication style to better connect and work with others. So um, before we get too far in, um, I have a short poll for you, and it's just two questions. Don't take too, too long to think about it. Neither answer is going to be really exact, but there's two options for each question, and uh, you can go ahead and answer those when you're ready. Okay, now I'll launch the second one. Perfect.
Um, it wants me to show the results, but you don't want me to show the results yet. Um, that's okay. Yeah, uh, let's hold off on that then. We'll, we'll take a pause and we'll launch we'll okay. the second one after. How's that sure. sound? Sounds good. All right, all right. Um, yeah, so so we will. You will get to see the results of of the uh, poll question in a few slides. Um, but I want to start off with a video clip, and it may be um, something that you're familiar you with. Look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head. Did you guys pick up on that? Sure, uh, we did. Something's wrong. So raise your hand if you've ever had that thought looking at another human being. Like, what goes on? in their head. What is happening for that person right now? I don't know what conversation they were just part of, what brief on the project they heard, but they are obviously not in the same realm of reality that I'm in, right? I've been married for almost 18 years. And on a weekly basis, at some point, I look across the dining room table and I have this thought, what is going on inside that man's head? Right. So this is sort of the nature of, of human beings, of who we are. And what we're going to talk about today in terms of understanding and learning about personalities is kind of like having a quick peek or insight into someone's owner's manual. Right now, human beings are, of course, dynamic. So if we all had an actual owner's manual, it would be the size of an encyclopedia set. Right. And if you're too young to remember when encyclopedias came in sets, then think of it as an entire Wikipedia website. Right. And there's, of course, lots of things about us that make up who we are. But our personality is, you know, a good book all on its own. It's a good chunk of how we make decisions, how our behaviors start to mimic a lot of patterns, right? Patterns for ourselves over the course of time and also with other people. There's seven plus billion people on the planet. We're all unique in our own way, but we also exhibit a lot of the same patterns. So the first pattern I want to talk with, uh, with you guys about is understanding yourself and what you do. So you can think of this as sort of how you present yourself to the world, almost. So we sort of have two sections here. On the top half of the circle, we have outgoing. And on the bottom half of the circle, we have reserved. So outgoing people tend to speak and move with very high levels of energy. Um, I should probably just read the notes, otherwise that'll be confusing <laughs> as I talk over what's written on the screen. So outgoing people tend to speak and move with high levels of energy. Their gestures and facial expressions have more emotion than a reserved individual has. Right. So there's, of course, if we think of this as a bit of a spectrum on the bottom half of the arrow here, if you can see my cursor, you know, that's somebody who is still outgoing, but they're a little closer to the midline versus somebody at the top of the arrow. I've lost my cursor, the top of the arrow, which would be like the most outgoing. Right. But everything above that central line is outgoing, outgoing sort of actions, people who are quite charismatic. They have a lot of facial expressions, right? A lot of gesturing with the hands. They tend to talk maybe a little quicker and sometimes a little louder. Opposite to then we have our reserved individuals and reserved people tend to speak at a more steady pace and with far less force and or volume when they're speaking. Their gestures and facial expressions seem more guarded than the expressions of outgoing individuals. So somebody, again, who sits at the bottom of that reserved arrow, they might use some facial expression or gestures, right? But they're still quite reserved versus somebody at the very bottom, right, of the reserved circle at the tip of the reserved arrow, who really just has their hands nicely folded in place, right? Not too much going on while they're speaking, right? So two very opposite ends of the spectrum. At the end of the day, there's a couple really key differences. Um, outgoing people tend to be fast paced. They tend to be very involved in things. They're very energetic. They have a lot of energy to give and they sometimes take a lot of energy or there's a big exchange of energy when they're with others. They tend to be more optimistic, right? Doesn't mean they can't have a bad day, but they tend to see glass half full. And they're usually pretty positive, enthusiastic, right? But all of that culminates into one thing, which is they really focus on talking things out, as opposed to reserved folks. Reserved folks, as we mentioned, are slower paced. They tend to be considerably more cautious. They're quite concerned and sometimes reluctant. They are excellent 
critical thinkers and they are very discerning. All right. And so the focus for reserved people is on thinking things through. Right. And this is probably one of the biggest things when it comes to communication. If you take nothing else away from the webinar today, I want you to remember this. Outgoing people think out loud and reserved people think inside their head. So when you ask an outgoing person a question, the next thing that comes out of their mouth is not an answer to your question. Okay, let me say that again. When you ask a question to an outgoing person, the first thing that leaves their mouth, it's not an answer to your question. What you're hearing is their thought process. It's their brain thinking and processing the question you just asked them. And then eventually, if you hang around long enough and can stay focused, they'll probably come back to what their answer is. And they'll emphasize that or repeat it or, you know, affirm with some head nodding like, yeah, yeah, that's the one, that's the one. So they will eventually answer your question, but what you're hearing in the meantime is their thought process. And on the opposite side to that, when you ask a reserved person a question, they will respond with, nothing but the answer. You will hear nothing from them until they have thought about the answer that they're ready to give you, right? And so these are two very big differences when it comes to communication, right? I worked with somebody one time, a gentleman, he was in his late 50s, and he came to us at the break when we had gone through this material already, and he said, I've been married for over 30 years, and I just realized today why my wife doesn't want to watch TV with me, because he was an outgoing person. And every time he saw something or thought about something that was happening, he would be narrating, right, his thought process or the storyline itself, and it drove her bonkers, right? And I don't know what he thought prior to this, maybe just that he annoyed his wife or his wife didn't like him, whatever that was, right? But there's actually a really big disconnect when it comes to communication. So quick question for you guys, knowing that very few of us are all one thing or all the other, right? Many of us fall in the middle of that spectrum somewhere. But if you had to say, at least for the moment, you were 51% one thing, 49% the other, how many people on the call today think you are probably outgoing? You can raise your hand or give us a wave. Okay, a few folks, excellent, thank you. And who here thinks that likely more on the reserved side? Okay, thank you. And so I don't know if anybody else noticed, it's uh, a little bit more visible when we're in person. Usually the outgoing folks have their hand in the air before we've even finished the question. And reserved folks, they have a hand down here. They're like, I am acknowledging you, but I don't want to bring too much attention to myself, right? So um, Sandra, if you can show us the results of that first poll question, I'm really eager to see, um, what those were. So, um, okay, so 40% saying they're excited to have lots of places to go and people to see, and 60% saying they're really longing for the quiet days when they didn't have too much on their calendar. So I'm curious to ask, for folks who answered that they were outgoing, did you also answer that you're the people who are really excited that you have lots of places to go and people to see? Was that congruent for the outgoing folks? few people. Okay. And how about for our reserved folks? If you said that you're likely more reserved, um, did you also answer that you're longing for the quiet days when we didn't have too much on the go? Right. So it's not to say that, you know, this isn't um, some sort of like magic, you know, magic test or something. Um, but again, some of us do fit right really close to that midline. So if you are sort of wavering and you're unsure, you're like, I can imagine times when I'm outgoing and I can imagine times when I'm reserved, that poll that we took would be a really great indicator for yourself of where your natural tendencies tend to fall, yeah? All right, before we go into the next slide, let's throw up the second poll question and we'll take a moment to answer that. I'm having trouble getting the second poll. I oh, think we're going to okay. have to um, say, let's say it verbally and get a show of hands. 
Sure. Um, so I'm getting paraphrased. Sure. Can you my, favorite, my favorite thing when it comes to collaboration is, is the question. And, and so option one is um, the great people that I get to work with. You can give a thumbs up on your reaction button. If you really enjoy the favorite part of collaborating is the great people. And you can use the hand clapping emoji. <laughs> um, if your favorite thing about working and collaborating is the great projects that you get to be a part of. So thumbs up if it's the great people, hand clapping if it's the projects. No right or wrong answer. And I know some of you are out there saying both. I want to do both. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for sharing that. OK. So going and talking about our next people pattern. So this is looking at how you respond. This is understanding yourself in terms of how you respond. So how you process or take in information and where your priorities lie around that information. So on the left-hand side, you can see is task-oriented. And on the right-hand side of the circle, we have people-oriented. So our task-oriented people tend to focus more on the job to be done or the goal to be accomplished. They seem to be far less influenced by the opinions of others, and they're more logic-based in their approach, right? And that really comes through in decision-making and their preparation for things and how they like to see things structured. On the right-hand side, the people side of things, our people-oriented individuals tend to enjoy the company of others. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> And they seem to focus on people as the priority rather than the project at hand. They seem to be more influenced by the opinions of others and driven more heavily by their emotions. Okay, So two really distinct differences here between our task-oriented uh, folks and our people-oriented folks. I say folks because people-oriented people just gets to be too much of a mouthful. So again, left-hand side, our task-oriented individuals, they really love things like procedure, function, programs. If they have an opportunity to plan something, they are probably in their glory. They want to sink their teeth into a project, and that project better come with the process, right? These are words that really get uh, our task-oriented people quite excited. And they focus on getting things done. Right? That is the reason that they want to use and prioritize all these things like procedure and function and, and programs. 100% task oriented, love it. <laughs> all right. On again, the right hand side, we've got our people oriented folks. They're focused on relationships, caring, sharing with one another. A lot of that sharing comes through emotions and feelings, right? These are folks that tend to wear their heart on their sleeve and friendships, right? So the focus on them is for connecting with others, okay? And here's a really great um, example that we like to use for this one. So I'm gonna paint you a picture. Imagine that you are heading into the grocery store. You've got about six or seven things on your list, but you're kind of just squeezing it into your day. So you're coming at the end of the grocery store's uh, opening hours. You've only got about 15 or 20 minutes before they close. And if you're already thinking to yourself, that doesn't sound very organized. I'm not sure that's a good, good use of your time to get your groceries. Um, I can probably tell which side of the circle you, you lean towards, um, but go with me here. So this situation, 15, 20 minutes to go, you've got a couple things on your list of grocery items and you're confident, you know where stuff is in the store so you can get them. You just gotta stay focused. As you turn your cart down the second aisle, opposite, uh, the opposite side of the aisle coming towards you is your neighbor. And you haven't seen your neighbor in a while. They're a great person, but it's been a long winter and you haven't chatted with them to find out how their mother's doing since she had her surgery. Well, you have one of two thoughts in that scenario. One is, what a great opportunity. I get to connect with a neighbor, find out how her mother's doing, you know, hear about how the kids are, see how they made it through winter. Or your second instinct is to put your head down, turn your cart around and get around the corner of that next aisle before they spot you. Because the task at hand is to purchase the groceries, right? So put up your hand if you're more likely to duck around and get back to the task at hand and focus on that grocery list. 
right? You're probably sitting on the more task side of things. Okay, thank you, great. Now, if you're stuck there with me, with not uh, nearly a grocery in your cart and you're running to the convenience store because you've missed the entire 20 minutes because you chatted with that neighbor, put your hand up if you think you're more on the people side of the circle. Or at least you're gonna browse past them and give them a quick hello, right? So again, this is a really big difference when it comes to so many things, to be honest. When we look at these two people patterns and dynamics, our outgoing reserved only tends to account for about 20% of miscommunications and conflicts. And I would say communication is a really big part of that, less so conflicts, right? When it comes to energy levels and um, how, how we communicate, those things seem to be ironed out a little bit more easily. When it comes to our priorities between task and people, this actually stands for about 80% of where a lot of our conflict comes from, right? Um, because again, if you have different priorities, right, you're going to be focused and wanting different things. So we're going to take a few minutes and um, uh, we're going to put you out into breakout rooms. And I'd love for you with your partner just to share um, share something about yourself. You can share whether you were outgoing or reserved, whether you think you were task oriented or people oriented. And specifically, I'd love for you to share with your partner why you thought that. What behaviors do you know or you know have experienced about yourself that you believe put you in sort of one pattern or the other? Are those instructions relatively clear? Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So hopefully that's led to some good conversation for folks. And uh, maybe you learned something new about someone else in the group, but maybe also uh, something about yourselves. So now that we've talked about the two different, sorry, I should just double check with Sandra. Is everybody back? We're good, right, Sandra? Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So um, now that we've talked about the two different uh, patterns, that we, um, that we see, um, this is sort of what makes up DISC. And so we're gonna talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, what I'd love for you guys to do for folks who are taking notes or who like to take notes, I'd love for you to jot down a bit of a table like this. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be on a scrap piece of paper, but just the letters D-I-S-C across the top. And as we go through those letters, those four letters, D-I-S and C, I want you to think of two things for each of those letters. I want you to give yourself a rating from one to four. A one would be, my gosh, what she's explaining with this personality style, that sounds almost exactly like me. And a four would be, that sounds absolutely nothing like me, okay? So for each one, you can give yourself a little bit of a rating on one to four. But I also want you to think of the name of somebody who it does remind you of. Specifically, try and think about people who you know closely and really well. So this would be likely people you've lived with at some point in your life, parents, siblings, children, partners, past partners, roommates, those sorts of people, right? So as I'm describing maybe some different characteristics or attributes and you think, oh, that kind of reminds me of so-and-so, then just jot down so-and-so's name, all right? Um, any questions about that table? or the information. Okay, perfect. And again, this is just for your own your, your own info afterwards. All right, so DISC. So what is DISC? Well, DISC is the matrix of human behavior. And of course, there's lots of different methodologies and, and um, personality assessment tools and styles out there. Um, and the one that we use at Human Dynamics Training is DISC. So if you think about those two people patterns that we talked about a few minutes ago, and I'll try and bring my cursor up here, on the top half of the circle, we have our outgoing folks, right? D's and I's. On the bottom half of the circle is where our reserved folks sit. These are our S's and C's. On the left-hand side of the circle, we have our task-oriented individuals. That would be our D's and C's. And on the right-hand side of the circle, we have our people-focused or people-oriented individuals, our I's and our S's. So I'm going to break those down and talk about them a little bit more specifically. It's important to remember that within this whole structure, the matrix of the DISC model, there are actually 41 different personality blends, 
Okay, so not unlike something like Myers Briggs, or they've got the 16 and stuff, it can actually get really kind of complex and speaks to the uniqueness of who we are as human beings. But for the um, purposes of learning DISC and for the short time today, we're going to look at it just at those four levels of the D, I, S, and C. So our Ds. Our Ds are our outgoing and task-oriented folks, okay? And the D stands for dominant, and that is very indicative of who these people are, right? They tend to be very driven. They're results-oriented. These are the people who want results, but they want them yesterday, right? They are on a timeline. They are making things happen. They're a wonderful person to collaborate with and have on your team because they will drive things through to completion. Now, they may drive everybody crazy in the meantime, but they will get it done, right? That's another D word. Ds really just like to get things done, okay? So again, D are outgoing and task-oriented folks. What they really need more than anything are results. Okay, if you said to them, we're going to work on this project, we really need your expertise, we don't have a lot of structure just yet, we're not even sure of the timeline or if the client's going to do much with it, but they've hired us, so let's give it our best shot. They're going to take a hard pass. They're like, no, thank you. I am looking to put my time and energy into something, I want to see that end result and then move on and check something else off, right? What they need are results. So that's our D personality. So you can, again, give yourself a rating. One, sounds very much or almost exactly like you. Two, maybe there's some sense there. Three, not too, too much, but I heard one thing that kind of could be me or a four, not anything to do with me at all, okay? And if, as an I, uh, if you have somebody in your life that you feel maybe could have some D in their personality style, then jot their name down. All right, moving on to our eyes. Sorry, I, I, I should, uh, I'm gonna take a quick pause and let you know. While you guys were in your breakout room, I went back and got to view all of the great uh, comments in the chat. And unfortunately, I am not a multitasker person who can both present and monitor an eye on the chat. I get completely distracted. So by all means, use it. I, I think it's wonderful. You got some great uh, connections going on. If you're putting a question in there for me, um, I'll have to come back to it after. And if you have a really burning question that you want to ask, feel free to take yourself off mute and just ask me, okay? Or like, feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I'm that kind of presenter, okay? So moving over to our I personality style. So our I folks are, are outgoing and people oriented, okay? And the I stands for inspiring, yeah, inspiring. So the I's are, um, you know, what they need more than anything is fun. And fun doesn't really resonate with a lot of us from a work standpoint. But what I like to say is they are the ones that bring joy, right, and excitement to things, right? They're the party people. They want to know who's going to be there and most importantly, who's going to see them, right? That's what the eyes are really interested in. And um, when I also think of eyes, I tend to think of, you know, if you want to sit down with a delicious uh, bottle of cold Coca-Cola, and you open that and start to drink it and there's no carbonation left, it's just not the same, right? It's cold, it's wet, it's got the caffeine that you're looking for, but it doesn't have that fizz, right? The eyes bring that fizz, that excitement, the charisma, right, to the team and to the project. Yes, they can get awfully distracted in the meantime and you will often have to wrangle them back in, right? But they do have a lot of energy and they bring a lot of excitement and joy to the project and to what's happening, right? So the Ds need results. And what an I needs more than anything is fun. If you invited them to work on a project and you, you know, sold it to them as we're going to be working with other people, but to be honest, your part is kind of isolated and into itself. So we don't really need you to be at the team meetings. You're just going to get your nose to the grindstone, put your head down, do the work, do the same sort of thing over and over again for the next three to six weeks. And then we're just going to put it all together at the end. They might say yes because they want you to like them, but like they're out at the two week mark. You know, they just don't have the interest to sustain that kind of thing. They want to be with people. They want to be working together, right? Again, they want to show you their greatest outfit that they just put on that they bought the other day, right? And also they want to be in a collaborative space, right? So that's the I, right? Very outgoing, lots of energy and very focused on people. 
All right, so again, I'll give you a quick moment to jot down your rating for yourself and maybe a name. Moving down and, uh, down and around the circle, I should say, we're doing clockwise here, um, to our S personality style. So the S personality style here are our reserved and people-oriented folks, right? And the S here stands for supportive. Yeah, you will not find a more supportive person in your life, in your work, than a high S, right? Everything about who they are and what they aim for in their goal is community, it's solidarity, it's teamwork, yeah? So at the end of the day, it, these are really the most wonderful people that you, you know, in terms of collaborating and wanting to be supportive and, and, and promote other people's ideas all fantastic, fantastic qualities, right? With our S personality, sometimes they are so reserved that sometimes we're not always hearing from them, right? They have all these wonderful ideas and skills to contribute and they keep it hidden in the back because they don't want to, you know, take away attention from somebody else or interrupt or seem like they're being conflictive or whatever those, those um, feelings for them might be. Because what an S needs more than anything is peace and harmony, yeah? And so in their very nature, they tend to shy away from conflict, right? Let me just say this, because this is a really distinct uh, difference here. Ds, Ds don't just love conflict, they kind of thrive on it, right? If you get two Ds in a room or you have two Ds working on a project together, they can hash out those arguments and those details and they can debate till they're blue in the face. And five minutes later, the meeting's done. You want to grab a coffee? Yeah, sure. I know this great place. And they're off and they're best of buds because it's not personal for them. That's just who they are and how they operate. But a high S in that situation is like, you know, uh, figuratively curled in under the desk looking for shelter. They don't even have to be the one involved in the conflict because things for a high S are always personal, right? They're, they're people uh, oriented, they're very driven by their emotions and they're very heavily influenced by other people's opinions, right? And so all of that leads to a lot of their decision-making coming from a very personal standpoint and their interpretation of others also coming from a personal standpoint, yeah? So again, these need results. I's need fun, S's, they need peace and harmony. So the other challenge is if you have a team that's not gelling together and you're expecting a lot from your S on the project, probably not gonna happen. That's not the best environment for them to be able to offer and give you your best work. Okay, the high S. So we have our D, we have our I, we have our S. Last but not least, our C personality style. The C personality style is also reserved, but they sit on the task side of the circle. And the C stands for cautious, yeah, cautious. So often at this point in the presentation, we say, um, you know, sometimes in larger groups, we'll say, okay, put up your hand if you're this, put up your hand if you're that. If you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, you've only asked us two questions, you have given us limited information, we've only been at this for half an hour, you haven't shown us any studies, I'm looking for the details, the statistics to support what you're saying. If those are some of the thoughts going through your head, there's a good chance that this is your quadrant. Yeah, these are your people. So with their very cautious nature, C's tend to be extremely detail oriented. Right. That doesn't mean that any other, you know, somebody who sits in one of the other quadrants can't be good at details. It's just that by the nature of who they are, they are always looking for more information. These are the folks that are constantly asking questions. Sometimes those questions border on nosy. Sometimes those questions border on, you know, if, if it's a, a subordinate, for lack of a better word, right? You've hired this person and they're asking you questions and you're thinking, this is awfully disrespectful the way they're asking me these questions, right? That is them trying to make sense, trying to get the full picture, right? So they have all of the details and information to feel like they can comfortably move forward. Right. And as you're a freelancer, that can be really awkward if you um, have a lot of C in your style and you're working with a client who does not. Right. 
you probably feel like you're constantly having to drag information out of them. Or you sometimes might go away from a meeting feeling like, why am I asking all these questions? They should show up at the meeting. They should know this stuff. This is their business. This is their project, right? You may be bringing a skill to that dynamic that they just don't have. You're thinking of things that aren't on their radar, right? So the C stands for cautious and uh, the Ds need results. The Is need fun. The Ss need peace and harmony. And what a C needs more than anything is to be right. Yeah, see a lot of faces from that comment. What scenes need more than anything is to be right. Now here's the kicker. If you do have C in your style, you are often right. You rarely make mistakes. You think things through. You're very cautious and detail oriented, but I'm here to tell you that doesn't mean always, okay? And I live with one of you. I, you know, I love you guys. You bring so much to the table that I don't have in my style, but it does not mean you are always right. So it's important to use that very cautious nature, that critical thinking, that curiosity to continue to ask questions, but ask questions that open up the conversation, right, for others. Ask questions that allow you, especially on the people side, right? These think so much of their questions and they sit on that detailed side of the, um, excuse me, the task side of the circle, that sometimes they forget to ask about the really important questions around the people, right? Who are the customers that we're trying to reach? What are their needs? So that's equally important information. Right. So that's our D, I, S, and C. And the really important thing when we teach DISC is that we're not using DISC and the, the system um, or the assessment of DISC to label people. Right. It's not about going home or going to your next meeting and saying, oh, you're this and that's why you do this. And I just know that you're going to. That's not what we're about. We want to use this tool as a way to help us better understand folks, right, that we live with, that we work with, that we want to better connect with, right, from a personal standpoint, because that builds a great relationship, and from a professional standpoint, because that builds a great business, right, and really um, levels up the work that we're providing for people. So I want to take a minute before we go into our last section and just get your thoughts. I'd love for folks, if you're comfortable, you can take yourself off mute. And if you prefer to put it in the chat, this is the one time I will have the chat open and just share something that you, you know, have found interesting so far that you've learned about yourself, so on and so forth. Um, I got a question. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I work with a, a fair number of Americans, and I've noticed they tend to be more emotive. Like I've had clients who say, you know, gee, that's wonderful, Carl. It's amazing. It's terrific. And they just mean it's okay. You know? <laughs> okay. I, I yeah. think there may be a difference between men and women on this. My perception is that women tend to be a little bit more outgoing, a little more bubbly than some guys who sit back and just sort of watch. Interesting. Um, does that work into it? So that's a yeah, that's a great question, and thank you for bringing that up. So, the the answer I'm going to give you is 100% anecdotal, and that's just based on my experience in learning this disc material and in working with people over the last. I, I became certified in 2016, but I first came to this material when I started dating my husband 24 years ago. So, it's been with us for a while. So I think of you know, and the other thing I'll say is because I teach this and I kind of live, eat and breathe disc, I often tend to see things through this lens of disc, right? So we, we all sort of sit somewhere in that quadrant and then we exhibit behaviors from, you know, the D, I, S and C. Then I also think that culturally we're brought up with things. And if I think about different, um, you know, nationalities or cultures, I feel like they fit into different quadrants. So I think of Americans as being very outgoing, maybe more to the D side, but definitely like the bigger and the better and the loud. And, you know, whereas Canadians, we tend to sit maybe more on the reserved side, maybe a little bit more to the S side. You know, we want to be here. We want everyone to be friends. So I definitely think that there is um, a culture aspect that then adds kind of a layer 
uh, of onto this dynamic. Um, and I also think to your point about men and women, I think socially speaking, women are raised predominantly to be thinking about the people side of the circle, to be thinking about emotions and talking about feelings. And that doesn't mean that every woman is comfortable there because there's plenty of women that sit naturally on the task side. But what they might do is bring a bit more of a balance to their work, um, possibly. Whereas men are brought up a little bit more naturally to focus on things like getting results and, you know, projects and things that are uh, more structured, right? And less of that feeling, touchy-feely side, right? So I think that adds then another layer to it. Um, so I know that really answers your question, but maybe that's kind of what you're kind of picking up and perceiving with some of your, yeah, American clients. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a question here from somebody, is it Laurieann? Yeah, about doing the desk, uh, desk profile 10 years ago and how much variation there, there would be with age or as you change jobs. So that's another great question and it's one we often get. Um, when you do an assessment with us and we work with, um, if we're certified with a company in the States called Personality Insights. Um, and when you do their assessment, you actually come out with two graphs. One is called your basic and one is called your environmental. And very much as it sounds, the basic is kind of your core personality and your environmental is heavily influenced by the people around you. So when you're younger, that might look like your family, but also are, are often when it comes to our work um, and our career, it's dictated by our job. So your environmental will absolutely change. In theory, in theory, your basic personality style shouldn't or doesn't change too much over the years, yeah? However, what we have certainly noticed with a lot of the clients we work with, some of which we've worked with over, you know, decades now, at least a couple decades, um, is that we naturally develop a little bit more emotional intelligence as we get older, right? It's a beautiful thing. I think it's called um, wisdom, right? That comes with maturity. And because a lot of personality style assessments are self-assessments, we do actually notice a change and a shift. So I think just naturally we've become a little bit more self-aware. And I don't think your personality style necessarily changes per se, like from the D, I, S, and C, the really strong ones. Um, but I like to think of it as a gem whose sharp edges get kind of gently rounded out, right, or softened as, as we age. So, so there will be some, some changes if you were to do a profile now versus 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I know when I was in, I was a leader when I was uh, 26 years old in a position and uh, one of the guys I was supervising told me I was like a drill sergeant. Okay. And so um, I've learned some better people skills over the ensuing decades and um, learn to appreciate uh, just the impact on people when I'm only obey those task oriented impulses instead, you know, remembering, ask how they are first, you know, do a little bit of the chit chat, connect with people before I dive into all the task stuff. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great point that I'm going to, we're going to go into in just a moment. So the next couple of slides I have are actually thinking about how we might adjust our natural style when we are connecting with somebody who is of a different style. So the reason I wanted you to write down the names of folks as I went around for DISC, thinking about somebody who like, oh, that kind of reminds me of my brother-in-law so-and-so or, you know, um, is because we don't always know who our, you know, who our client is. We're not gonna have them do an assessment. It might be our very first meeting with them. And for, for folks who are really outgoing, those behaviors tend to be, you know, kind of as Carl was mentioning, those are a little bit more easy to pick up on. Like, how do you know what their priority is versus task or people? And sometimes it's just a little bit of intuition. Sometimes it's like, oh man, I, this conversation feels a little like it's not coming together. It's kind of like when I'm trying to talk to my brother-in-law about stuff, it has that kind of feeling to it, right? So sometimes when we're starting to learn this material and starting to implement it, we can kind of draw from our experiences, our past experiences with other people in our life and apply those to the new folks that we're meeting and working with, right? 
So um, I did just want to, let's see if I still have it copied into my, oh, I think I do. I'm gonna put um, a link to, um, it's essentially our newsletter sign up, but if you want to get a copy of the slides from today, I'll be happy to send those out to you. Um, and, uh, and as I said, because the next couple of slides, we're gonna go through them quickly because we're gonna wrap up on time, um, but it gives you some tips and tricks for connecting or communicating with folks who are a DIS or C personality style. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. So if we're thinking about communicating with a D, right? We wanna get to the point, right? To, to Sandra's point, they don't need the chit chat. They're not looking to have things sugar-coated. They wanna get the information out and they wanna move on, right? Um, and, and so that's really important, right? To, to have that focus and allow yourself to bring that focus to the conversation at hand with them, right? Try and keep the focus on the conversation. If you're trying to talk to them about the project and then you're also trying to, you know, talk about how maybe it's somebody you've worked with before and, you know, there's that networking meeting, like they don't want to talk to you about the networking meeting next Wednesday. You're there about the meeting for, you know, said project, that's what they want to focus on, right? So just kind of understanding that that's where their priority is be prepared for confrontation. A lot of us aren't comfortable with confrontation and that's definitely a skill that you know can be developed as well. But as I said, Ds are naturally um, confrontational and it's not personal. They don't think that you're a bad person or ill-prepared for them. That's how they feel like they get the best out of the conversation. They get to the best end result, right? Um, but if you're not prepared for that, it can feel like all of a sudden you stepped into an attack right? It's not an attack. Kind of be mentally prepared for them to ask tough questions and push back a little bit. When a D pushes back, that's how you know they're interested. If a D doesn't give a crap, they're not going to talk about it, right? And then finally, providing a win-win opportunity. This is a little bit more in sort of like a sales negotiation, right? Which again, it's freelancers, you often have to do. Um, if you have a D client, you know, they can be a very nice and caring person, but they're still going to come to that interaction, making sure that they win because there's something innate within that D. They're a very dominant style. They want to win. So when you can present information that feels like a win-win to them, right, that they're going to make sure that they're not on the short end of the stick or the losing side, you're going to get better buy-in from them. Okay. All right. The I style allow for brief social conversation, like Sandra said, right? Just a little chit chat. Don't ask them, you know, this is really great. Ask closed ended questions. Don't ask them how their weekend was. That can be a half hour story you don't have time for. Ask them, did you have a good weekend? Yes, you did. Wonderful. And then jump into it, right? But again, allowing for that brief conversation is important. Otherwise, and I think that you don't like them, right? And you might not care if you like them or not. They're just a fine human being. Let's get through this project. But if that's a client, again, they're going to go with somebody else down the road who makes them feel like they're liked, right? So it's important interaction to be aware of. Um, try and relate information to, uh, especially things that are a challenge, relate the issue to people. So let's say you're working on the website and you're trying to explain to them that the platform's not going to work because this and that and that they're smart people. They're logically understanding everything that you're saying. But if you say to them, your customer's going to have a harder time accessing the information because of the way it's laid out, boom, now they understand what the problem is. So relate the issues to people. That's how the eyes are going to connect with what you're saying. Ask them their opinion, excuse me, ask their opinion where appropriate, right? If it's a client, of course they have an opinion. Maybe it's somebody who's a little bit more junior that you've brought on to your team, but you know what? That's going to be important for their development and growth. So it doesn't mean that you always have to ask for their input, but it is going to help build that relationship to ask for their opinion in, in places where it's opportune to do so. And then this is really important. Provide details in writing, especially for follow-up. Again, this may feel patronizing because if the client is the quote unquote project manager or the boss of the job, you're like, I'm supposed to tell them if you want them to show back up to the next meeting, having done the stuff, you need to make sure you're following up and put those things that you know you agreed to in your meeting, put them in writing, right? Because that's going to be really important. Eyes are very in the moment. So they're like, yeah, this great meeting. They understand everything. But then they leave the meeting, they remember that they forgot their wife's birthday, and now they're on to flowers, and like everything you talked about is, is out the brain, 
right? All right, S's, S style, um, speak softer and more slowly. And I will admit, even having a fair bit of S in my own style, the first time I heard this, I thought it was extremely patronizing, to be honest. What I have since learned is that there is an intimidation of extreme energy that outgoing people bring that can sometimes shut an S down, right? So again, you're not getting their best answers or ideas. They're not contributing fully to the conversation because they are just sort of recoiling from this extreme energy, right? And you probably already noticed I also have a lot of outgoing in my style. So this is a big one for me that I constantly have to remind myself about. Be sincere. No one likes a BSer, for sure, but S's have something innate within them. They're very empathetic and their focus is on people. So that exchange of energy when something just, you're trying to slide something past them and just, mm -mm, it's not going to fly. They won't verbalize that they're uncomfortable or that they don't believe you, but it will come out in other ways, right? So it's a really great way to sever a relationship is not to be sincere. So if you don't know something, that's okay. Just say it. Or if you've forgotten, you know, don't try to just try to, you know, wash it over. In a one-on-one -on -one situation, especially if you have to talk about something kind of delicate, make sure it is just one-on-one, -on -one, right? So as an example, if you have to talk to them about the invoice that they forgot to pay you, don't do it while there's another, you know, a third person on, on the call or in the meeting, right? Find those one-on-one -on -one settings. Um, and then give them time to reflect on, on um, questions that you need answers. If you go into a session and you're looking for brainstorming and immediate feedback, not likely to happen, right? Remember that reserved people need that time to process. And last but not least, the Cs, be credible with your information and your statements, right? Ss can kind of sense the BSer, but Cs will just research to make sure that you're not BSing. And if they find out that you did, you're dead to them, okay? Information and details and credibility is really important. Again, give them advance notice. If you've got an agenda, give it to them ahead of time, make sure they know what to expect. Lay out clear expectations, quantitative is best. If you're looking for feedback on the website, hey, I'd love to hear three things that you really love and at least two things that you kind of think can be improved, right? Give them some specifics. They will appreciate it. It's not patronizing to them. And lastly, give honest feedback about what's going right. Now, if you have people who are working under you or with you, uh, it doesn't mean that you should let bad behavior slide or poor performance, but you don't need to harp on it. With a C, they are perfectionists at their core, and nobody is harder on them than themselves. So address it, let them know what needs to happen going forward, and move on, okay? And maybe even cushion it with, you know, positive enforcement of stuff that they're doing correctly. All right, I know we've got like 30 seconds left. No, nope, barely. We're two minutes over time. I apologize. Um, you guys are welcome to um, stay connected with me. Again, I put that in the um, chat there, the window. And I'll also quickly throw in my LinkedIn if anybody prefers to stay connected that way. Um, Sandra, I'm not sure what your time is like. If anybody does have burning questions they want to ask, I'm happy to stick around. Thanks so much, Andrea, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. If you do want to stick around, I'll hold it open for a bit, but if you've got to go, totally understand. That was very informative, and I'm already thinking, oh, how to relate to people differently. That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today, and thank you everybody for joining us. Mm -hmm. If you have Anybody questions. Have questions? Yeah. Carl, yeah. I was just going to say, you're also welcome to email me questions, because if you might, if you have reserved in your personality, you'll think of an amazing question you want to ask tomorrow, and you're welcome to send me an email as well. That's great. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll see everyone later. Bye now.